everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday, March 14th, 2023 committee meetings of the Marble Town School Board. We'll call this meeting to order. We'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Which was great. However, when I asked 
for all tax general fund bill support. I did not receive a response from him or anyone else on the board who I speak to on email. I sent several follow-up emails over the past two weeks. The only response I've received is from uh, Ms. Damasco, so thank you very much for um, connecting with me today. Um, full transparency to our community regarding the district's expenditures. It's a personal interest of mine currently for a few reasons. First and foremost, I'm a tax-paying resident of this township, and I have multiple children being educated within this school system. This leads me to my next concern with the district continually eluding our teacher spending support. While the business administration collects the highest paid salaries in our state, that's right, not just surrounding, in our state. We pay our teachers significantly lower salaries than all of our surrounding districts, while members of our business administration are paid more than any other district in the state. 31% more than Radnor, 33% more than Rose Team Media, 59% more than Springfield, 33% more than Ridley, 22% more than Haverford. These numbers wouldn't matter nearly as much to me, maybe even not at all, if we could say the same about our teacher salaries compared to other districts. And I hope that you can show the appreciation you claim to have for our outstanding teachers by closing that salary gap during the salary negotiations before the end of the school year, so we can keep the outstanding teachers in our district that we already have. Um, and for any teachers that are listening, I'm here for you and I appreciate you. My name is Michelle Graham, I live here, and I have two children at Rockwell. I'm wondering if you guys are going to look into that platform? I got no problem looking into that platform. Okay, is I, there I, I, got, I got no problem. You guys weren't aware? I mean, no, I it's not, it was brought up last time. It, sometimes it takes things, it takes a little bit of time to get things moving. I got no problem looking into that platform. It, it, it's, it's a lot of documents, so I want to make sure we're being respectful of our employees' time with the things they do. But you understand they should have been uploaded like yeah, I months actually, and years well, that they're not there. Well, I, I, based on what you've represented, I understand that. I'm going to ask Mr. Sweeney because if we're out of compliance, I certainly yeah, would want to be in compliance. So I have no problem looking into that. Okay. Any other comments during the budget meeting? Is there time? Is there more things yes, to ma follow? Okay. Uh, we have this is this is uh, this is our budget meeting, and then we have a facilities and transportation meeting, and we have a curriculum, excuse me, curriculum instruction and technology meeting following that, all back to back. You know, yeah. let me do, let me do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, board and Dr. Kane. My name is Allie Kelly, and I spoke at last board meeting about the many similarities between Marco Midtown and the fact in the district I have been teaching at for 20 years. In talking with some of my teacher friends here at Marco Midtown these past two weeks in between the last meeting, they were telling me how the morale is so low because they feel unappreciated because of their low salaries compared to most districts in our region. As we already know, they have seen many of their dedicated peers leave Marco Midtown and seek employment in other districts for 10 to 20,000 more per year. One thing I didn't realize until they just told me is due to a teacher shortage, a Spanish teacher who had just five years of teaching experience was hired at step 10. The kicker is that we have dedicated teachers that have been with us at Marco Midtown School District for over 10 years and they're only on step eight uh, due to step freezes. This is a total gut punch. I would feel completely underappreciated, just as they do. I do understand that there's a teacher shortage and it was necessary to pay this new Spanish teacher as much as you did to fill, a, fill the position. Yet, this action is going to create a wave of teachers leaving our district to find one where they're appreciated. I know it's difficult to find a foreign language teacher, but it's even more difficult to find qualified teachers to teach higher level science and math classes, and the very most difficult to find any special ed teachers. If the salary scale isn't fixed in this, coming, this upcoming contract to incentivize our experienced teachers to stay, our district is gonna be in big trouble. As I hope you're also aware, the amount of people entering the teaching profession has significantly decreased in the past 10 years. With the change in the pension system and the added responsibilities and expectations put upon teachers, it's nowhere near as desirable of a field to go into as it was when I went into it 21 years ago. What happens if we lose 25% of our teaching staff? This is a possibility. Yes, you could.
could hire new teachers, but at what cost? Would you hire them at a significantly higher step just to get them in the door like you did the Spanish teacher? Anyone could do the math and realize that's a terrible business decision. Also, what's to say the new teachers won't leave after a few months when they get a better offer in another district? They don't have any ties to Marvel, so why stay? <coughs> I saw this happen all the time with new teachers at McFacton. The one thing that finally changed everything at McFacton at the mentioned the last board meeting is when the district realized they had to do something and they ratified our contact, contract this past December 2022 to make our district competitive with others. I will tell you, I finally, after 10, 15 years, feel appreciated. I stopped looking for other teaching positions and other professions. I'm a science teacher. I, I could get jobs doing other things. But um, my end salary is still projected about $10,000 less than the highest paid district around us. But I am totally okay with that because we're competitive and I like where I teach. I have seen many families. I've seen many kids go through, many siblings go through, and unfortunately, I'm old enough to see a, a child of a student that I have go through. So, uh, <laughs> I am that old. Um, anyway, <coughs> but I, um, I can assure you that the teachers in the Marple Newtown School District aren't demanding to be the highest teachers in the state, but they just want to be competitive. The Marple Newtown teachers love my kids. They love our kids. Please give them a competitive contract. It will pay dividends in our future. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment at this time? I have a related comment, not, not directly. This is the time for that? Okay. Just please state your name where you live. And turn the mic on. Is the button green? The button's yeah. green. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Uh, I have a related issue. Um, Nick Wozak, Sussex Boulevard, the two kids in the district. Um, as a parent of two children in the district, I'm asking you today to, once again, uh, improve clear and transparent communication to residents and parents, in particular by stopping the practice of deleting all but the most recent board meeting on the official uh, Marple Newtown YouTube channel. In 2021, the board graciously began streaming uh, recordings of the board meeting on YouTube, which is helpful. However, while the platform allows for the maintenance and, and archiving of hundreds of hours of footage, um, and I've sent to the board uh, examples from six neighbor, neighboring districts. Um, the videos are deleted from the public record so that only the most recent video is available, often for a period of, of two to four weeks. Um, the video recordings provide nuance, context, and additional detail that really benefit parents and residents looking to stay engaged. Some recent examples that have been deleted include the plain talk explanations of budgetary items, like the ones today, uh, question and answer sessions about curriculum, block scheduling, and candid public comment segments. Uh, meeting minutes, while are very helpful, are summaries and are not approved until the following general meeting as the basic policy, uh, which means there are often blackout periods where neither the minutes nor the video are available to residents through official channels. Um, a couple ideas here. In order to promote transparency and community engagement, I'm asking for the board to consider looking at two concrete changes to uh, policy Manual 903.1, Electronic Recording Devices at Board Meetings, which was last revised in April 2021. Um, the update is, it is in detail in the email, but it basically says instead of saying that uh, the district, uh, the recording made by the district is the exclusive property of the district, and may not be downloaded, copied, or altered, or distributed in any way, updating that to something like without citing the original source. Um, other opportunities for changes in the policy are where it says the district intends to maintain the video recording for a period of time of, of its own choosing or at their discretion uh, to commit to a period of 18 months. Um, if these updates cannot be made to the board policy at this time, I personally am asking for permission to, as, as an open records request or whatever you want to call it, uh, to be able to download and repost the official board meeting records um, to an independently maintained YouTube channel, unaltered, unedited, to act as a public record while these changes are being made in the interim. Um, these requests are made, uh, are, are not meant to be uh, conversational, it's meant to be a way to promote transparent and open communication in a manner consistent with all the surrounding districts, um, engage the community, and reduce uh, multiple administrative open records requests every time somebody wants to review a, a meeting uh, transcript or, or videos. Um, I look forward to, to hearing your, your comments on this, or your developments on this, um, and feel free to reach out to me directly with any additional follow-up questions. Thank, Thank you. Sir. 
well, there's one person who hasn't commented yet, Nam, yet. <laughs> How would you like to step up to the mic? You don't have to. Hi, I'm Diana a daughter at Loomis, so I don't have anything prepared, but I just wanted to be here to kind of get a feel of how the operations work and also just to kind of speak my support for the upcoming contract negotiations with our teachers. I feel like it's one of those things that we don't want town to walk out the door. So I'm just hoping that people kind of see the community support and is open to that and really come with real negotiations. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right, any other public comments? Okay. There will be two more opportunities should, if there's anything you didn't want to say. We can adjourn the budget meeting and sail right into the facilities. Um, Mr. Gallagher is also not here. He's on pre-planned vacation. Um, and Mr. Reynolds is not here. Is there anything anybody wants? I, I see there's not a whole lot on the facilities item, uh, but there is one thing under 4.05, Mr. Orwig. Yeah, I have no uh, proposed motions for this monthly meeting regarding transportation, just an informational item. Uh, as per school code, school code, we'll be performing our bus evacuation drills for all children, all grade levels, all schools uh, during the month of March. Um, any public comment? Transportation facilities, other issues? Okay, we can adjourn that and go on to pre code instruction and technology. Mr. Shiana? 5.02, uh, I don't believe there's any additions to the agenda. Correct? Anything to add? Beautiful. 5.03, at the end of the month, we'll be uh, looking into approving section five of the agenda related to the curriculum instruction and technology. 5.04, approval of the minutes. Nick, is your mic on? It is not. Uh, okay. No, no, I'm, I'm just having trouble hearing you. Uh, okay, I love it. It definitely is not on. Thank you. It's on your age. You're the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you're, you know, you're talking. Well, yeah, no, I don't. Yeah, that's, thank you. Because uh, especially for the record, for YouTube, you need that mic on. So then 5.05, uh, we'll be uh, voting on to approve the first reading of reviews for policy 201, admissions of student, and policy 204, attendance as presented. And it looks like we have a good bit of motions, 5.06, informational items. We will be voting on state testing schedule as presented, Marble Newtown High School murals as presented. Uh, 5.07, summer learning programs. 5.08, credit recovery of Marble Newtown High School. 5.09, Marble Newtown High School course description changes. 5.010, responsive classroom agreement. Mm -hmm. 5.11, star of the day workshop. 5.12, best buddies ball. That sounds interesting. 5.13, Immaculata University agreement. And that motion would be to vote on to approve agreement between Marble Newtown School District and Immaculata University for dual enrollment offerings for the program. 5.14, Marple Newtown School District K through 12 guidance plan. That would be the program. Uh, 5.15, so we'll be uh, making a motion and voting on administrative trips, one for uh, superintendent, another for the superintendent. Uh, 5.16, there will be some student trips that we will be voting on. 5.17, as usual, books disposal. 5.18 technology to approve the financing of checkpoint security firewalls through the HP Financial Services that cost us $79,638 a year for the coming five years. Um, as far as other business, I believe. Just, I have, um, I, if you don't mind. Um, uh, and, uh, and this is for Mr. Serini. Um, Mark, we had asked you after the last meeting um, to look into some questions that were raised about uh, our. Uh, past director of communications um, and certain issues that were involving like his employment and pension. Did, are you able to comment on that? Or would you comment on that, I should say? Yes, yes, thank you for uh, asking me to do that and I am prepared to do that. So would you like me to proceed? Please. Okay. I did notice at our last school board meeting, a public meeting that took place February 28th of this year, some familiar faces and some new faces. So to the extent that there are some newer faces, I would like to start by introducing myself and explaining what my role is for the school district. Uh, I'm Mark Serini, as my name plate says, and I am the solicitor for the school district. The solicitor is the main lawyer for the school district. My client is the school district as an institution. I do not represent individual board members. I don't represent individual employees. 
I represent the school district as the institution. Uh, my office is a private law office. I'm not an employee of the school district. And I work with other attorneys and legal assistants to help the school district as the solicitor. So I refer to that group of people as the solicitor's office. Uh, so I'm the one who leads the solicitor's office for our school district. Um, there are two main areas that I do not handle uh, for the school district. One is special education, which is a highly specialized area of the law. And the other is labor negotiations. I do not handle labor negotiations. The school district has what is called special counsel for both of those areas. But my office handles just about everything else unless something very peculiar comes up that we need to recommend a special counsel for. Uh, we do uh, handle employment law for our district and we've handled that ever since we started as solicitor in 1998 here. So we do handle employment law. And we handle a wide range of other matters for our district. I've been a solicitor since 1990 in a public school district. Starting in 1991, I, I had been a solicitor in multiple school districts. Uh, I'm not saying that because I pretend to be infallible. I'm a human being. I make mistakes. I sometimes say things that are incorrect. Like I think Mr. Driscoll may have done, rather than how ma'am you feel that you said he lied to your face. I like to think based on my knowledge of him that he made a mistake uh, in speaking to you. But regardless, I don't want to in any way act like some arrogant jerk lawyer. Uh, I don't think I am that way. I really try not to be. Okay, so. Why, am I, why have I introduced myself and explained my experience and explained that I also handle employment law for our school district? At the last meeting, as Mr. Bilker mentioned, one member of the public made some rather strong accusations against our school district. And because I have always advised any school district school board that I represent that we should not, we as a board, should not discuss personnel issues publicly. And that remains my advice in general. I realized afterwards, and I think Mr. Bilko realized afterwards, after that meeting, that the district was left, my client was left in a position where it did not respond to these accusations. And both Mr. Bilker and I feel that we have to respond to these accusations. So. I, as the solicitor, am going to be responding to these accusations about a former district employee. And, I, and I'm, I'm attempting to do it in a helpful manner because although my advice to school board members is not to comment on personnel issues publicly, I know some of the members of our audience are teachers in other districts, and I think you would want the same thing from your school board members not to be talking about your personnel issues publicly. There is a difference between what the board can and should do and what members of the public can and should do. Members of the public are entitled to comment on personnel issues, personnel matters. There's no prohibition against that. But of course, as a member of the public, and I, I've been in your position too, I've come up in my school district and my township and made public comment. Along with that right to make public comment comes obligations. And those obligations include speaking accurately, speaking facts. Um, if you're going to assert a fact, it has to be accurate. You can, of course, express your opinion that's not based on the fact without any constraint under the law. But if you assert a fact that is false and it damages somebody's reputation, we as public commenters, again, I'm in the same position as you when I attend meetings for my school district in my township, are liable for what's called defamation. So
So I understand that we're in a bigger context, but it's a heated context of labor negotiations. I've seen it cyclically ever since I started in 1990. And I know sometimes emotions get high and heated. But I encourage whoever comes up and gives public comment to remember that if you're going to assert a fact, please make sure that fact is accurate. If you assert a false allegation of fact and that damages somebody's reputation, that person whose reputation is damaged can hold you liable for that. I know when I make a public comment, you know when you make a public comment, enjoy any special protection getting up here and making a public comment. So please keep that context in mind of what specifically I'm going to go over. I don't believe, I can see most of everyone who's here, I don't believe this, the person who made this comment is here tonight, unless I'm not correctly identifying the person. But at the last public meeting, that person who came up to the podium and made some factual allegations about a former employee of the district, the former communications director of the district. I, I just want to briefly go through a chronology. Our district, when that incident happened involving the now former employee, was immediately notified of the incident uh, and the, the uh, charge against that employee that was brought by law enforcement was immediately notified of that charge and immediately through my office prepared a statement. And I have a copy of that statement. It was dated December 20, 2020. So 2020, more than two years ago. And it's brief. It reads, the district is aware of the recent charges involving a district employee concerning alleged non-work related conduct. I emphasize non-work related conduct. That's a very important difference, non-work related. The district must recognize the criminal charges, especially those involving non-work related conduct, are only allegations and that people who are criminally charged must be presumed innocent unless proven guilty in court. And this is what we call the presumption of innocence. And I'm not sure what our teachers in the audience teach, but if you've ever taught social studies or civics, you probably have touched on the presumption of innocence. It's one of the most important principles in our United States Constitution, the presumption of innocence. I was a former criminal prosecutor, and I can't tell you the number of times the judge said to the jury, this person who's accused here is presumed innocent unless Serini proves him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And although I didn't really like having that heavy burden, it was my responsibility to take on that heavy burden. So a person who is accused of a crime is presumed innocent under our Constitution that I'm sworn I took an oath to protect them and must and, and is entitled to defend against the charge. That person is not required to confess to anything. That person is not required to admit to anything. That person can say, I'm contesting this charge. I want my right to be brought through the process up to and including possibly a trial at which I have to be proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. That's the only time the presumption of innocence disappears. When a jury uh, says a conviction, you know, decides to convict and the judge upholds that, or the person pleads guilty and is sentenced, that then becomes a conviction. Until then, the person is presumed innocent. Why is that important? It's important not only in the criminal context, in the litigation context I'm talking about, but also in the employment law context. Imagine if you're a teacher working in a school district and someone makes a false accusation against you. You are gonna say, that is false, I'm gonna fight it, I wanna be, I want, I'm gonna exercise my right to go through the process, I'm not confessing to anything, I'm disputing this charge, and however long it takes, employer, 
I expect you to leave me alone. Because all that has happened is I'm being accused of something. No jury or judge has found me guilty of anything. So that's a very important principle from an employment law perspective because there is law in Pennsylvania, both statute and also case law decided by judges that says that if an employer, any employer, interferes with the rights of, the, of an employee who's merely charged, based on that charge, without a conviction, that employer violates the law. That pertains to hiring and everywhere else from that point on. So just because someone has been charged does not mean an employer can get rid of that person. Okay, that's, a, that's an important principle that applies everywhere. Now let's center on public school employment law. Every single employee within, your, within our district and the districts that you work with, whether that's an administrator, whether that's a teacher, whether that is a part-time maintenance worker, has under school law, a state statute, good cause protection. So you get that as a teacher, but you also get that as a non, what's called a non-professional employee. Any employee of the district gets that. So that person, let's put it this way, no public school employee is what we call an at-will employee. You may have heard of that term. An at-will employee is someone the employer can fire for any reason or no reason at all. A public school employee is different. A public school employee has job protection rights. So that's one more reason why a public school district cannot fire someone who's been charged with an offense. That's one more reason. Now, this particular charge, in contrast to other uh, recent incidents involving our district, the charge itself involved a car accident. The very term accident is in the charge. So the, the, the charge made by law enforcement against this now former employee was based upon an accident, an accident. Yet we heard someone get up to the podium and use terms like kill, and perhaps that same person has posted on social media now saying that, that our former employee was a murderer. That is not the charge. That was never the accusation against that employee. It was a charge involving a car accident. Not murder, not homicide, not manslaughter, a car accident. That was the charge. And it was actually under the Motor Vehicle Code, not even the Pennsylvania Crimes Code. So that was the charge. In contrast to other situations, this was not work related. This conduct was not work related. The employee was not accused of being under the influence of alcohol. Ma'am, is there a question you have? I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how, um, I, I see how this is relevant to the last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I remember who was here and made the comments. Okay. Um, but I feel like as far as what we are discussing, so much I would like to hear answers to tonight okay. that this feels irrelevant. Okay, may I ask you please to give me the same courtesy that I give you? I know, I know you whispered to your neighbor, but that, that distracted me. You know, it, you probably have classroom rules as a teacher. Sure. I'm not sure you want your students okay, whispering I'll, I'll to somebody else. Out loud then. Um, right, but ma'am, now's not the time. Like we teach our students, there's a time and a place. I'm speaking now, and I'm referring okay, to I'm what listening. was brought up at a previous meeting. I'm listening. That as solicitor and the board president feel we must address as a school district. So if you can please bear with me, I will continue. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. So that conduct was not work-related. 
that conduct did not involve uh, the person being under the influence of alcohol or controlled substance, nor did that conduct involve children. Again, not work-related. This particular employee did not confess to law enforcement, did not make any admission to law enforcement, and instead decided to contest the charge as is that employee's right. Also, from an employment context, that employee chose not to resign. We've had other situations recently that are different, involving work-related conduct, involving children, involving confession, an immediate confession to law enforcement, and involving a decision to immediately resign from the district. So the speaker at the last meeting tried to draw some correlation between the two, uh, incorrectly suggesting that we're treating one employee differently from the other, which is a false accusation, given what I just outlined. There are significant differences, starting with non-work-related conduct versus work-related conduct, going to, to deciding to contest the charge and not resigning, to confessing to law enforcement and deciding to resign. Those are the significant differences from an employment law perspective. Ultimately, this employee we're talking about, a long time after the process started, and this, this was February 10 of 2023, um, negotiated what's called a guilty plea with the prosecution and was sentenced. And what that employee was uh, pled guilty to and therefore is considered convicted of was not even what that employee was originally charged with. What the employee was originally charged with was graded an offense above a misdemeanor. But what the employee was convicted of was much lower and that is a misdemeanor of the second degree. And that's significant for the next thing I'm going to get into. So as you may know, the way uh, offenses are graded, you have homicide, which is the worst, felony first degree, felony second degree, felony third degree, misdemeanor of the first degree, misdemeanor of the second degree, and then at the very bottom, misdemeanor of the third degree. So what this employee pled guilty to was the less the, the most well let's put it this way the least serious short of a misdemeanor of the third degree he pled guilty to a misdemeanor of the second degree it was a negotiated guilty plea the prosecution did not do that um, without the support of the family the family supported that decision the family of the other uh, person involved supported that negotiated guilty plea and the judge accepted it. And that became the conviction, a misdemeanor of the second degree. Now, there is uh, law that applies to public school districts that says once an employee is convicted, can that employee remain an employee of the school district? If the employee is convicted of a disqualifying offense, the school district must terminate that employee. A misdemeanor of the second degree, this conviction, is not a disqualifying offense. So this employee could not have been terminated for that reason by the district if this employee remained an employee. So, Again, the suggestion that the district should have fired this employee upon being charged is wrong. The suggestion that, this, that the district should have fired this employee upon the conviction is wrong. What this employee decided to do is to offer his resignation for the purpose of retirement. And the district accepted that. So it's considered a retirement from the school district. 
which brings me to the next area. There was a question where comments made about pension, where the implication of the school district played monkey business with the pension law and somehow unfairly advantaged this employee as opposed to every other employee entitled to a pension in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That suggestion is flat out wrong. I'll briefly outline for you the facts that show this employee is entitled to the pension. Now, another false implication about the pension is that it somehow came from our school district. A pension does not come from our school district. As public school teachers in our own age, you know it comes from a completely separate agency. I refer to it as PSERS. A lot of times you'll see it as SERS, but it's the Pennsylvania State Employee Retirement System. Completely different entity from any of the 500 public school districts. We don't control the pension. There's separate law that says whether a public employee is entitled to a pension. And one element of that law is, if you serve at least 10 years for a public school district, you then become vested at that level. This particular employee was hired by our district June 29, 2011, 2011. And then from that point, 10 years later, that employee vested with PSERS June 29, 2021, long before um, the current time period. The, um, at the time the, dish, the employee tendered the resignation, the board accepted it. It was January 24, 2023. And as of that time, that preceded the sentencing regarding the other matter, the litigation matter. The board approved the resignation of that employee and for pension purposes, that employee was considered in good standing. I'm not sure what is happening with the pension. That's really none of our district's business. It's up to the state to monitor and enforce that. But I do know that a misdemeanor of the second degree does not disqualify an employee from entitlement to a pension. So a conviction for misdemeanor of the second degree would not disqualify this employee from a pension. I think the speaker somehow, um, and I'll give the speaker a benefit, the benefit of the doubt, got confused over the timeline and got confused over how teachers obtain tenure, which is a completely different principle, as our teachers in the audience know, from being entitled to a pension from the state system. And I think the speaker, again, to give the speaker the benefit of the doubt here, may not have realized that our district hired this employee going back in 2011, 2011. So I saw some social media posts that said, raised something like, did the district do something to try to stretch out the three years to get him entitled to a pension? I presume mistaking, you know, mistaking that for the three year tenure period, but I hope now everybody who is here and is listening understands that this employee uh, was hired in 2011, 10 years vested in 2021, and even the conviction that this employee ended up with for that car accident did not disqualify him from a pension. That is not a pension from the school district. The school district does not control that pension, does not, is not in the position to grant or deny it. That is the state agency that does that. The last uh, topic that I'd like to address relates to a further accusation. And uh, that speaker decided not only to, well, I'm not gonna say decided to, but that speaker not only made false assertions of fact regarding the former 
school district employee, but then also brought in that former employee's father into this scenario in which that speaker accused the school district of misconduct, suggesting that uh, due to the relationship, a business relationship, allegedly between the father and the district, that somehow or another that motivated me, and I'm gonna bring myself into this personally, because I'm the one who advised our district all the way through this process of how to do it the right and lawful way, of somehow letting that interfere with the district's obligation to do right by the employee and do right by all of our other stakeholders. And the accusation was something to the effect that the district paid the father $40,000. I checked into that. The father did not receive a $40,000 payment or any monetary payment in that regard from the school district. The father is an employee of a very large insurance brokerage firm. His division handles workers' compensation, uh, liability, property damage, type of insurance claims. And that division, through the father, acts as our district's insurance broker for that type of insurance coverage. Liability, property damage, workers' compensation. That father is an employee of that company. There is a separate division of the company that is called Gallagher Benefits Services, separate from this father's division, that administers the health insurance for um, a county entity that school districts can decide to belong to. And also, this separate division provides consulting services to our district for benefits, which is very common for employee benefits. Try and find the best ones available for our employees at the best price. So, again, I'm not sure where this speaker got this accusation from that the district paid to the father a certain amount of money. I'm not sure what that has to do with the price of eggs in Egypt, as one of my teachers used to say when I would ask questions that she thought were uh, irrelevant. But that is that. So there is absolutely no connection between the two. The district followed the law, as Dr. King can attest. As soon as we learned about the charge, Dr. Kane herself personally spent the time with our solicitor's office monitoring that charge regularly to, to make sure we knew what was going on with that charge and make sure we knew what the status of that charge was and that if it reached, depending upon what ended up being a conviction, if any, and the timing of it, we, we both worked together to make sure the district did what it was lawfully required to do and lawfully what it was allowed to do. So, all that uh, brings me back, and thank you for your patience and listening. All that brings me back to the very first point, and that is my general advice to the school board that because the law allows personnel matters, employment matters to be discussed privately by the board, that the board members continue to do that. That does not mean that members of the public cannot comment on personnel issues, employment issues. You can. But I encourage you, um, and, and obviously I don't represent you, I'm not giving you legal advice, but I do encourage you that if you, if you make a public comment and you're expressing what you believe is a factual assertion, to make sure that it is accurate, to make sure that it is truthful. Of course, that's different from opinion, and I'll close with a little bit of humor. I, you 
opinion and example of opinion that you could you could walk right up to this podium and say, Serene, I think you're stupid. I think you're obnoxious, I think you're arrogant, I think you're this, I think you're that. You could that's your opinion. The difference between opinion and fact is opinion cannot be objectively measured. So look at it that way. If what you're saying is purely opinion, you're not going to run yourself into any trouble. But if you're getting up there, just as I know when I make public comments, if I'm making a factual assertion, I'm on the hook. I'm responsible for what I say. And if that factual assertion is false, and I was careless about the falsity or reckless about the falsity, and that causes someone else harm, I could be liable to that person. That is what is called defamation. So again, the difference between opinion and making an assertion of fact. So, um, Mr. Milker, hope, I'm sorry for taking up so much time. Hopefully, from your perspective, I've addressed everything you feel should be addressed. Mr. I was deferring back to you. I do have a clarifying question, if that's okay. Is that okay? It is okay. Will you just wait one? Sure. Just from of course. You know, it? Actually, you should address Nick. It is oh, his sorry, meeting, sir. not mine. Is that okay? Uh, I'm happy to wait as well. Uh, I believe we're one more second away from public comment. Sure, of course. Thank you. All right. So that was other business, and we are down to 5.020 public comment. Oh. Please 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 <laughs> please. Okay. So this is Michelle Graham again. I appreciate all the research you did into that commenter's um, statements. I wanted to add, because it's clear you've done a lot of research into what she said about something else she asserted, and that is the difference in teacher raises versus administration raises since 2016. So in a comment, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, she alleged that in 2016, the teachers got a 0% raise while the administration got a 4% raise. The next year, the teachers got a 2.4% raise while the administration got a 4.25% raise. The next year, the teachers got a 2% raise while the teachers got a the administration, excuse me, got a 4.4.25% raise. The next year, the teachers got a 0.3% raise, while the administration got a 7.6% raise. The year after that, the teachers got a 0.5% raise, while the administration averaged a 6.4% raise. And the last year, the teachers got a 0% raise, while the administration got a 4.71%. So I, I can tell you've done a lot of research into the comments from the board meeting of last month. I was wondering if you could clarify if those percentages are correct. Ms. Graham, I saw what you did there. Are you, do you have a, a legal uh, attorney background? No, I do not. <laughs> I'm actually a speech language pathologist. Um, I work for the IELTS. No, I, I, I commend you. Okay. You know, I mean, it, it's, you kind of, you know, brought back, brought me to the issue that you would like to address, which is fine. But what I have to respectfully remind you of, is that my presentation was addressing what happened with the false accusations against our district sure. of wrongdoing. Right. And remember, also I said at the beginning, I don't handle labor negotiations. So that's not something that I am so you invest involved with. I just want to make sure I'm understanding. You investigated this commenter's statements just regarding the legal investigation of the former district employee and not the rest of her comments. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yes, ma'am. I don't investigate people's comments in general, um, but if, as I attempted to explain, if someone makes a false accusation against our school district sure. that really needs to be responded to, that's, that's where I think the board president and I are on the same page, that that's, I have to step up and respond. I did not do that last meeting because and I think I tried to explain that, but my general advice is the board does not address personnel issues publicly. Okay. But the more this rattled around my brain, and I think the same for the board president, we both came to the same conclusion. That, that set of accusa accusations requires a response from the solicitor. I understand. So However, may I? Yes, of course. Yeah. Mr. Warwick, are those numbers accurate? I 
could even answer that tonight without having to go back and have that information and then do some comparison, some fact finding of it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if she was using a particular example or not, and, and stop me if I go too far here, but I had only, I, I think I had only sat on the negotiations team once or twice in the past. And my recollection, this is public record, right? My recollection is that the last contract gave a 3.3% raise each year of two years. So I don't know how, I, I, I don't know I'm how. I'm wondering if it's because the steps were frozen, which is where they're getting they, a lot of your percentages. The, uh, I didn't think, there's a difference between a step, can you address that, Jim? Sure. Yes, there, there are two different issues. There were, my recollection, without having any data in front of me, there were two true step raises. Mm -hmm. Step or salary? Step and salary. Okay. I can't quote the years. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, know, I know that one was 2008 and 2009, which every employee in this district of a salary freeze, and that was something that came out of Governor Corbett's sure. edict during the Great Recession or something sure. of that sort. Yeah. And then there was a second mm -hmm. step and salary freeze. I don't recall the years. Okay. Now there were times, other times, where there was a step freeze, but money still came to those teachers. So there's a misnomer that step always equals a dollar amount. You can freeze a step in a salary scale in order to grow the salary scale with regard to steps, but that doesn't mean money didn't come to that individual employee at that step, if that makes sense. Sure, I, yeah, I, I was okay. under a step process for years before I came in contact with the IU. I guess my question is though, what, why weren't the teacher steps restored? With, I understand 2008, it was an economic crisis. We all, I certainly did not get a raise at the IU. We understand that, but I, I guess I'm very concerned that the teacher steps were not made right. Well, all, that's since all that's done through negotiations. No entity can make that a single year decision. Sure. So I that had to be done through good faith negotiations. Right. Which all these contracts were. So both parties agreed to that. Right. I, I, I guess I'm concerned with this contract. And I know that that is the teacher's wish. And I'm wondering if that is your wish as well to make sure that the teacher's steps are reinstated. Uh, I don't want to. I know that this is an area of public interest. Yeah. I know it's an area of tremendous public interest. Mm -hmm. um, and what I want is a fair deal for our teachers mm -hmm. and our stakeholders, right? I will, as we go on, I really want to respect this process, okay? I really do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want this as us versus them. I don't feel that way. I don't think the school board feels that way, okay? I, I mean, the teachers, I think you feel that but way. But I don't, uh, okay? okay? And we don't. I, I, Michelle, I think yeah. our board, I know I think five or six school board members yeah. have children in the school district. Right. And we want the best of our children just as well. Yeah. So we're going through the process. You know, I think we'll come hopefully to a good result. But I think. I guess um, I'm not encouraged by what I'm hearing. In. Yeah, I mean, we want the best for, we want the best teachers to still early in the negotiation. I, I guess yeah. I totally understand yeah. that. I, I'm just so worried about teacher morale. 100%. Because it's low. I, I, I am worried about it too, and I care about that. And we, I, listen, we have a we have a meeting yeah. coming up next week. Like I promise you, there is nobody who wants this deal done more than me. <laughs> I guess okay. I'm asking them why. Why aren't we just doing it? Because it's you, 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 I, yeah, I'm going to ask you to understand. Yeah. That they're, like we have a responsibility to our stakeholders sure. in this town. Okay, mm -hmm. it, it can't be, it can't just say I want this problem to go away. Here it is. Like there is a, I believe a misconception that this will not require a tax raise to get this deal done. That can is I, not can I ask a clarifying question about that? So my understanding is that in 2014, 20% of the district's budget went to teacher salaries, and now that same percentage is down to 17%. I don't believe that's true. You don't, you're saying that's I, not I, well, accurate. Per, Ms. Again, Mr. Orwitz? Again. You don't know. I, 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 need, yeah, I need information. I, it's my understanding that you were spending the same percentage that we would not need to necessarily raise taxes. Is that inaccurate? I don't know. But okay. what I can tell you is I understand your point. Okay. But what, what 
I think one of the things that you're, if you're suggesting is that we've got 10 years look back and you're identifying what you view as problems mm -hmm. and you're saying, we want you guys to solve these problems and I would love to solve every problem. We all would like, we would like to solve these problems. I think the teacher's leadership, if asked, would say, we recognize this isn't all of your guys' fault, but we've got to deal with this contract right now. I believe that if you ask them, they would say, we don't, we don't necessarily put all this on you, whatever the situation is that we're in. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been on the board since 2014. Mm -hmm. I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Barb is, I think, our longest tenure person. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the, the step in salary freezes were before we were on, on here. So when they negotiate contract after contract after contract over the past 10 years and they come to terms, and now we're looking back and saying, this isn't work, they're saying it's not working for us, I get it, and I, we want to figure it out, and we're gonna work hard to do the best we can to figure it out. We've got to do something that doesn't hurt our district in the future, okay? okay. So yeah. I, I will tell you, you know, if you say, well, if you had done this, and this, and this, and this along the way, we would be here, that may be true, I don't know. Sure. What I can tell you is, right now, as we're sitting here, we're looking at, and, and Mr. Driscoll will get into this in the near future, with, without regard to any of the things the teachers ask for, the extent that they have mm -hmm. with regard to steps, we're looking at a tax rate. Okay. Okay, so, so it's a matter of I, I, I just feel like that money in and money out. Scare tactic, because <laughs> I, 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 can I finish though? Because I am also aware of the increased tax revenue from all the new construction in our district. I am aware that we, I feel like we have the money. The transparency regarding where the money is going would be helpful, and maybe I would really have clarity about where the money is going. Right now, though, when I see all the new construction in our district, million-dollar homes, $850,000 homes, townhouses, communities, I'm wondering where are all of their school taxes going. And, and I, I, I would just like to jump in. Yes. Yeah. And first and foremost, Way more productive money. We're not being attacked. Sure. We're, we're it's it's last, not our aim no, no, to no, attack it. I, yeah. I understand, but last week there was a little unnecessary. We need to work together here. Uh -huh. so, secondly, to your point where the money's going. Yeah. In the past, since I've been on the board in 2019, uh -huh. we've put $20 million in the coal zone, $20 million in the loop. Into the facilities. Into the right. their buildings. Sure. We, yeah. This past year, we put $12 million right. into the fields, the D1 field which also wasn't just for the athletes, we covered the band kids as well, they have a state of the art. So when people come here and act like, where's the money, where's the money? Right. It's a little, I guess you know, I'm wondering, that, right. does it matter when the schools are empty, like your special education classes are not staffed? So I absolutely <laughs> appreciate all the improvements, but to me, the most important thing is the education. Yes, and I totally agree with you. Yeah. But if you if you do some reading, the yeah. past four years, it's a significant drop in certification. I know. Are not there. I know. So that is, trust me, I'm sure everybody up here wants everybody to yeah, well, understand. We're this looking this, is, this You is, know that it's a historic. That's, I, think that's, yeah. I think that's. I think that's a perfect point. Okay. Is that this is, you know, I don't know if it's the wake of the stressors that were put on teachers through COVID. I'm sure that had some part to play in it. Right. There's less people. See, we know these things. This, but like, if you asked five years ago, yeah. that's not. That 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 wasn't. Sure. That's something that was being talked about, right? There wasn't a teacher, so there wasn't a national teacher shortage. Right. It, it, you know, Lower Marion didn't just build a new middle school and hire a bunch of teachers. Yeah. It was a lot of things that happened, and and we recognize that there's things that need to get done and that we'd like to do. You got to back. It's about balancing everything, right? Like, okay. you, we we had to expand those buildings. Sure, right? I understand. We're all, I understand. We're all the world project that we're looking at. Yeah. It, like. You want to have kids in music on a cart and art on a cart, and I want them to have the teachers to teach. Them I, I so do I. So well. of course we do. And the, the let, point is, let me just ask you one, and I'll stop after this one clarifying question. Do you want Marple teacher salaries to be comparable to neighboring districts? I, I would love that eventually, but it's going to. It's it. What we can afford, we're willing to invest into it. Okay, okay. that's what. Uh, what it's fair to the taxpayers. We, we know we need to put more money into it than we have in the past. It's, am I saying too much? Like this? Yeah, I, mean, it's, I it's, wouldn't it's, know if anyone but, but feels look, differently. The Lower Marion, please jump in if you want to jump in too. So Lower Marion, you know, we're not catching Lower Marion salaries. Right? No, they are, I don't expect they are, it, so I expect it to catch Haverford, Springfield, Wigley. That's going to take some time. Like their 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 salary schedules are big. And like I said, it's not just a snap of the fingers. I think it, you know, it, it it's a it's a good objective, and I'm and I'm not saying it's not. Right? We 
we want to invest in our teachers and we'll be prepared to invest in our teachers more so than we have in the past. We've got some good ideas. I'm looking forward to sitting back down with them. Okay. Um, and, and you'd like their salaries to be comparable to neighboring districts. I'm not talking about Lower Murray. I'm talking about neighboring Eventually, I would districts. love to, I would like to stop the Within gap. The I definitely want the gap to, I, I, I don't, I can't say that because I don't have all of that data. I would like to figure out, here's some things that are important to me. Yeah. Um, I would like to figure something out with our top staff. Mm -hmm. um, I would like that to look differently than it looks right now. Mm -hmm. um, and your first? I'd like to figure that out too. Yeah. I, I agree with that first though. Yeah. I, I'd like to figure that out too. And restoring steps. I don't know, I mean, so again, I, I don't want to get too deep into this. At some point, when this contract is settled, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Uh, and we'll talk about this, okay? Your neighbors. Uh, I don't want to get too deep into like I, I can't I can't do that. All right. That I want to. We we. I'm saying I. This is a board decision. I could come back to the school board and say this is why I recommend. They say we don't. David David and I can say we like this deal. And they can say we we don't. Right. This is a this is not the Matt Filter show. This is this is a group of nine. So the you and Mr. Control. Debbie, you are we are on the, we, are, we are not we are on the team. On the team with your business manager, work, yeah, Mr. Driscoll and Mr. Orwick okay. and our, our labor lawyer. Okay. And the labor lawyer team, have you shared that? Okay. And do you guys have a contract with him, I'm assuming? The district does. So. Where could we find that? It's probably not working for free. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Where could we find his contract? <laughs> open records request. So we have to do an open records yeah. request. It's yeah. not, mm -hmm. I guess that also speaks to the transparency in in the general fund the board meeting it'd be nice if i could just go back and look that up right now but i will do an open records request then all right thank you very much thank you yeah can i, can I just yeah I'll, oh you go you first the only comment i want to make just um, not so much the money everybody here has been a great actually it's been very great educationally for me so i'm really glad that i came here but i guess one of my concerns is if the teachers do leave our class size gets bigger and if our class size gets bigger the kids miss out and i don't think any of the parents in this room want that so i just yes it is about the teachers but also from a selfish perspective it's about my kid and maintaining that class size as well be. so that's yeah. i just yes, wanted to put that out for consideration i would mean, imagine everybody here doesn't want to have very plus right class. right it's not conducive for that. me again I am not very good at impromptu. You're very good at it, but um, <laughs> I would do my best. So um, I just wanted, um, Mr. Oreg, I just wanted to address, so you said sometimes when the steps were frozen, they still got money. Yes. So if a step is frozen, or let's see, if a teacher goes from step four to step five, they see they're expecting about, I don't know, on average, $1,500, $2,000. But then if it's frozen, there is money added, but it's a significant maybe only $500. So I just wanted to bring that up. Even though it, there is some money added, it's definitely not significant and it's definitely not what you're saying. Was that true? Was that true? No, that, that's not true. Um, I'm, I'm just the, saying from my experience, oh, I don't, oh, I don't, I, yeah, I'm saying from my experience being frozen in my district that I know I'm expecting to see certain salary raises and then if I'm frozen, sometimes they'll say, oh, we did put money in, but it's not, it's not like moving up a step. That's what I'm saying. And I, I'm not, I'm just pulling some numbers out, but I'm gonna say when you add money in, it usually does not quantify the amount that a step increase should be. Does that make sense? It does, but it's not applicable all the time. I'll tell you where that is applicable. <laughs> and, and it's people who are on step 16, there's no step 17. Oh, I understand that. So yeah. what you do is you add money to step 16, it's usually a negotiated rate through the contract, and that is sometimes seven, $800. But when there's a step frozen within the salary scale, mm -hmm. some of those increases were 2,000, 2,200, 1,800. They weren't just 500 oh, okay. inside the salary scale. So that scale. is very different from my district. Yeah. So I just heard that and I just wanted to, See, and if I can, I mean, my district, I was different. I just want to clear up steps a little bit. So we try to equate steps with years of service. It's impossible. Oh, I, I get that. Okay. I mean, I've been teaching okay. for 20 years in this yes. district. Yes, and there's no step 20, is there? No. no, I'm at 14. And, you know, we have, we have teachers on staff that have been here for 35 years. There's no step 35. 
So to say that steps equate years of service is not accurate. It's not accurate at all. That's why somebody mentioned you did tonight. You said a new hire came in at step 10 and referenced five years of experience. Well, again, does anybody know what her salary was prior to coming to Marble Newtown? And are you confident it was only five years of experience? So if I say to an applicant, how many years have you been teaching? 23. What do I put them on the salary scale when there's only 16 steps? Oh, I totally So I have get to that. say, what are you yeah. making currently? And how does that equate into our current salary scale? <laughs> But what I was trying to say, that if we have teachers here at Marple Newtown that have been teaching 10 years and they're only at step eight and they've been loyal to this district, how is it fair that somebody comes in from a different district gets a higher step than them? Again, nobody's sitting here saying it's fair. It's, okay. You've referenced it. 10 years ago, there were 20,000 certifications issued in the state of Pennsylvania. Today, there's about 5,000 annually. Your pool of applicants, and it wasn't a Spanish teacher or four nights special education teacher that you're referencing. There were three applicants. One of them wasn't qualified. Mm -hmm. I know how that goes in my school. Okay, so yep, I'm just, sure. this is the reality of yeah. the hiring process today as compared to 10 years ago. What I'm just hoping is that we make it up to our teachers that are dedicated, who have stayed here, and that we're letting people come in with less experience and we're not treating those people to fair raises that have been there. Like that's that's what I was trying to say with my comment, that people have been here for over 10 years on our lower step than people are getting hired in. Nobody's going to argue that the teachers don't deserve more money. Right. And that's what negotiations is all about. Yes. That's the process of it. Right. And I just wanted to mention one other thing that comes to mind. Um, my numbers are fairly accurate. They're not gonna be spot on, but I'm, I'm close. In 2018, we had about 312 professional staff. Today, we have 329. So we've added professional staff over the years to keep up with the influx of additional students the need for additional classroom spaces to keep classroom size small, which the board has committed to over the years. So, you know, some of the monies have certainly gone back into that great investment, which is into, into people, into professional and non-professional staff as well. Yeah, I do agree. I, I think our class sizes are very good in this district. And, um, but again, it has to be fair to our teachers them here it's just so we aren't in that big trouble as I said before um, also one other thing I wanted to talk about is that um, I there was some people who spoke about um, being senior citizens and having limited budgets um, I'm not sure if everybody was aware here but the Social Security in 2021 it was approved for 2022 to get a 5.9 percent cost of living and in 2022 December 2022 um, effective this January 2023, they have an 8.7 increase for cost of living. So it's social security, everything's going up. So we just have to meet our teachers closer. And like we said, not Lower Marion, even Havertown, I don't think we're gonna reach Haverford schools. But if we can get somewhere close, somewhere closer to the middle. I, I really appreciate what you're saying and your, your hearts are clearly in the right place. And I want, to get on that path too. That's right. what, I, I don't believe we're going to be able to snap our fingers and get this done. Year one, well, that one fell swoop. I don't know how long it's going to take. We want, it, we want to keep our teachers. We want a deal that's fair for our stakeholders. But who are your stakeholders? You've been saying it's- um, The community. The community. Everybody lives here. So I, if, if that's so important, why don't you join something else, not the school board? Like I feel like the school, we have to take care of our children. Like education is not something like a water bottle that you throw away after your kids are done with it. Like we have to keep on adding to it. Yes, I totally agree. Someone who came from the Philadelphia public school system 
if you're not keeping, if you're just blindly giving everyone everything, you're gonna have a district where you probably don't want your kids to be going. It, it's, somebody has to unfortunately negotiate. And everybody here, we, we're with you. Like, the gym deals prior, we're not that good. This is prior us, but you can't have just you snap hold? your I don't need to interrupt you. Go ahead. I, you I, okay, go ahead, I'm sorry, <laughs> I apologize. So you just can't snap your finger and fix a 20 year slash and all of a sudden from taxes to 5%. We can't cover the difference of what's the taxes in Haver County? How, what's the, does anybody know the I, I think that's a really, really good point, actually. It, it's, it's a serious issue. And, and, and to that end, uh, thank you for prompting that, because uh, again, I, I went through this district. I have kids here, but I went through this district. When I was here in the 90s, this board was nine old individuals who didn't have children. 0% tax increase after 0% tax increase. And, and that's great to keep taxes low, but it puts you in a different position than Haverford and Radnor and, and Wallingford Swarthmore. We've had very different tax policy in this town than they've had over the past 50 years. You've mentioned that there's been construction, there's new revenue, and you are correct, okay? But that's over really the past decade, right? This district is in a very conservative fiscal tax policy for, I'm gonna say 50 years, I don't, that's older than I am, I, I don't know, I, you know, I'm not being per perfectly precise, but over the people, a, a lot of challenges we get, and again, if we can deliver a zero, I would love to deliver like a zero percent tax increase. That's, I think all of us would love that, right? But we've, we've had to raise taxes over the past couple of years. We have, we've, so with that, with the new development that you're talking about, we've still been in position to, to get even, we've had to do that. So it's not, the boards from 30 years ago. We, and, and I don't think this was your implication, but I don't like the implication that we don't care about. I got kids who go to Lewis, two of them, okay? I'm in that building all the time. It's one, usually one of the best parts of my day, all right? We, many of us have kids in the district or have had kids in the district. It's not the board from the 90s. And we, I think we've behaved differently um, over the past 10 years, eight, nine years, 2014 since I've been on the board. Um, and I think a lot of people, I think many teachers you would ask would, would agree with that. Uh, anyway, I, I, I can't stop talking. I, we I have, to, yeah, we have to look and see what happens with these negotiations. I hope, I hope they're positive, and at least you're giving me some hope that you do have kids in the district, which is wonderful. Um, yeah, I just hope, I just hope that we're gonna try. Happy, we're, we're gonna try, we're willing to work. We've got meetings coming up, multiple ones scheduled, okay? It and, does take some time. Also, I've been through a strike too, and that's never fun either. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think I've been through five contract negotiations and one strike. So, I I definitely understand how negotiations work, and it takes time. But um, so I think the time's going to come pretty soon too. So, thank, you, thank you very much for all your time. Today. I would just like to add real quick: um, the 14 years I spent on your side of the wealth here, I understand where you're coming from, and I just wanted to say that we're often because we don't say much. Doesn't mean we're not hearing you. Doesn't mean we're not discussing it. Doesn't mean we're individually thinking, what can we do with this, and how can we fix this? So we are here. We are listening. And I know I can speak for myself, but I know I can speak for all of us, which is we really, really care about the children, and we really care about the district, and we really care about our teachers. So um, this hasn't, you know, been in vain or the conversation. Thank you. I'll add something. Dick's got a comment real quick. Tony, you haven't talked yet tonight. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say that in my association with, with our school board president, um, it's actually a 20 year association. So uh, I first knew him as a student in our home town. Um, he's taking advantage of the music program, the athletic program. His, his children go here. I'm a product of the school system. Um, I think there can't be a more genuine person on the school board than. Than our board president, Pat Wilker. And I don't think anyone should walk out that door thinking that what he's reporting is is not is not accurate and square. I really don't. Um, I take him at his word when he gives the update and, and I'm not in the negotiations directly, so so I listen to him. Um, and one of the things that's frustrating for me is to see all this stuff on social media. Um, and you know, there's only been two meetings so far. The board, to the credit of Mr. Bilker and to the credit of uh, 
Mr. Orbit and the Human Resources Department did attempt in the fall to begin these these negotiations, and they were not successful. So, so I mean, I I have no reason. At the last meeting, you know, it was a little uh, questionable, you know, about about. You know, it, it, it's a frustrating. It, it's frustrating um, to see to see a lot of comments on, on social media, really in general. But I mean, when Mr. Gopher says we want the teeth, we want to increase the salaries. I mean, that's that's genuine. That's legit. Okay. Uh, when he says we want to make sure that the the increased taxes that it's a uh, you know, reasonable increase, that it's not something that our community can. Or, I mean, he's, he's speaking with legit concern. I take him at his word. And I don't think there's a reason for people walking out that door thinking otherwise. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really excited to hear all this dialogue and all this communication. I think, you know, like it or hate it, the reason why there's so much chatter on, on social media is because of, of a lot of silence kind of, kind of coming from, from the district. So I hope that this is an example of that changing it, more of a dialogue, it, maybe more opportunities for Q&A. Well, to the extent that we can, as we felt, like I already am going through my head thinking I said too much tonight. <laughs> um, when we talk about X's and O's, until it gets to a point, I'm gonna, uh, until it gets to a, 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 a point further from where we're at, I'm gonna respect the process that's going on. Yep. And, 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 and just like the, the, the board is, is, is allowed to express opinions, I think the Teachers Association and parents, it is not just teachers in the room right now, just to let the, the record show. I, I'm not a teacher, uh, not a lawyer either. <laughs> um, the, speaking of lawyer, just, just one more qualifying item. Really important that we allow for public comment. And um, just a point of clarification, uh, Mr. 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 Sir, 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 yes. When we talk about defamation, I would love the clarification that we're talking about malicious intent to defame or defraud or uh, slander a person. Um, you mentioned very broadly that if you come to the public comment, you better get your facts right, or you could there could be a defamation issue. I want you to make sure that you let kind of the folks listening know that that does not mean that if you have a concern or if you've heard a fact generally, maybe not about an individual, but you're allowed to address that. So if I've heard about pay freezes, coming to the board and saying, I've heard about these pay freezes, please tell me about that, that is not defamation. The issue with the former employee is an outlier that should be dealt with, and you've done a great job explaining that, but the public should be able to come with the limited knowledge that they have and get clarification from the board. So could you just clarify that briefly before we begin? Would you, would you, Mark, would you please clarify? Yes, absolutely. Defamation means making a false assertion of fact, either negligently or, well, intentionally, with reckless disregard for the truth or negligently. It all depends on who the target of the defamation is, mm -hmm. what standard is required for um, culpability. Sure. Uh, that damages that person's reputation or that tends to damage that person's reputation. So making innocently misstating something about steps, uh, that's not going to tend to damage anybody's reputation. But for example, falsely accusing someone of being a murderer, um, that does tend to damage somebody's reputation. So the analysis is, is there a false assertion of fact? And was that made at least negligently? And perhaps depending upon the type of target of that defamation, it mm -hmm. might be a higher standard. But um, generally speaking, if it's a former employee of the district or you know, someone no longer a public official, the law probably would say negligence is the standard. Right. So, <clears throat> so oh, please. Raising one other thing you brought up. Uh, I know you go by Nick, forgive me for calling you by your first name. Nick's on is um, repeating something you heard. The law does say that if you, if you repeat a defamatory communication and do it in a way that you're culpable, you're, you're gonna be on the hook for it. So the best thing to do is to is just ask, you know, to say, I heard this, I don't know whether it's true or not, and I, would, I think this is something that should be 
dress. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a, a better way to protect yourself. Yeah. Than to just flat out repeat something as though you are reasserting it to be a fact. Yeah. And, and Does that I'll make be, sense? Yep, and I'll be brief in my response. I know we're, we're coming up on like an hour, a little over an hour. Um, there have been many times in the past two years where individuals have come with falsities and known falsities, um, medical issues in the past two years, COVID, um, no way to validate whether or not that was done maliciously. Um, that's not happening right now. What is happening right now is taxpayers, parents, and, and, and members of the community are trying to communicate concern and they're speaking facts based on the sources that they have. There's not a clear path for, for, for residents to, with, without, the, without the board or without open records and, and improving the website, saving YouTube videos, uh, there's not a real way for us to validate that right now. So I would just love for, for me, if possible, Mr. Suriani, you to confirm or, or, or clarify that individuals of the community will not be held liable for defamation or asking questions based on statements they've heard that are not related to an individual member of the district, related to contract negotiations, related to concerns about curriculum, all those sorts of things. Because when you led with defamation, I had to give that pause. So I would just like to like to know that yeah. the defamation statement was purely about the Trooper employee and not about the opportunity to do public comment. Oh, look, that's, yes. But remember the former, the, the accusations were made during public comment. So right. that's about, an, was, about an individual. Right, about an individual. So that's why I was tying it into public comment. Yeah. But if a, if a member of the public, you know, honestly mistakes facts about the teacher's contract and the negotiations and raises that, there's no way that could possibly be uh, something someone could be yeah. held liable for for defamation. Because it, first of all, it doesn't damage anyone's reputation. You know, to say that um, someone says it's step six and well, that was an honest mistake and that person's really step seven, and that's an example of whatever it may be. That, that's not defamation. It's crystal clear. Yeah. So the public should still be encouraged despite this incident to provide public comment. Oh, well, and share. this is our, we all yeah. work here. Yeah. Yeah. When, a, when a lawyer starts talking defamation. No, I, 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 I know, I'm trying to make great. I was, so, yeah. I was with you when you was talking. Yeah, so th thank you so much. Thank you for that clarification. You're, You're welcome. welcome. Perfect. Um, meeting adjourned. Beautiful. Yeah, so um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, respond to one of our public comments a little earlier. Uh, and just express that, that um, I am interested in exploring the question of, of maintaining our video recorded meetings beyond just the next meeting. I don't know whether that's a question of technology or whether uh, it's a question of, of funding, but uh, I, I would be interested in knowing the answer to that at some point uh, in the near future because uh, I do, uh, I don't know about keeping them up there forever, but for some period of time, I do agree with the comment that that is a good measure of transparency. All right, we're good. <laughs> Meeting adjourned.